All right. So welcome everyone to Parrot Analytics Live. We're going to give the waiting room a little bit of time to fill up. Uh, let's see here. I can see the numbers coming through. If you are just joining us, welcome. Uh, feel free to share in the chat where you're calling, calling in from, where you're Zooming in from. Uh, we'd love to see all of our global uh, attendees. So we'll give it a couple more minutes to fill up and then we will get started. Um, let's see, we have a guest from Mexico. Hello, Veronica. Where else? Awesome. All right. Chile, awesome. Hello, welcome. Very exciting. More Mexico, San Francisco, love it. I'm in California. Brandon, and Julia, where are you guys based? I'm in, Here I'm in, in Brooklyn. Awesome. Yeah. East Coast. So, I'm just a quick coast. Hudson swim away from you. So you know what? I'll just hop into the water. Hopefully I won't grow a third arm when I get out and I'll meet you for a beer after this. How does that sound, Julia? <laughs> I think you, awesome. you could get a third eye and then just be a recurring character on The Simpsons, which is my dream. So... You, you know what? That, that is that. peak entertainment industry goals. You're absolutely right. I'm going with that track. <laughs> I love it. All right, y'all. So, uh, all right, we've got a we've got a good number of people coming in through the uh, the attendee, and um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining Parrot Analytics Live for a very special edition of our webinar series today. My name is Rebecca Zabarski, and I'm the marketing director at Pair Analytics and also the executive producer of the Global TV Demand Awards, which are the industry's only data-backed awards event. So I'm gonna give a, a very brief background on what that is and then I will introduce our guests and we'll get the conversation going. Um, so we started the Global TV Demand Awards here at Parrot about four years ago because we noticed a gap in the traditional Hollywood award shows that grant trophies based on exclusive input from a very small group of people. And so what makes our event really stand out from other awards is that there are no judges and no voting committees to determine, to determine the winning series of the year. Uh, instead, we actually use our global demand data to measure the demand for individual shows and talent all year long. So we look at the data from the beginning to the end of the year. And at the end of the year, we award the most in-demand series in the world in a variety of categories. And so the winners are determined exclusively by audience demand data, which is global, and it truly represents what people actually want. And this is an exciting year for the awards because we've made some big changes. This year, we expanded to 20 categories. The first year we had two, that was four years ago. Uh, and those categories include your typical categories like dramas, comedies, documentary series. But this year we've added in some very special categories like the top superhero, which uses our talent demand. And Julia and Brandon will talk about that a little bit later. And also the revolutionary series. So that's a category that recognizes the top new show based on an entirely original idea, which is pretty revolutionary these days. Uh, and you can view all of the categories and finalists on the awards website, which is globaltvdemandawards.com. And I will drop a link in the chat so you can, you can visit that. Um, so the conversation today is going to focus on a few of the most interesting categories and the overlaying trends that they signal to us in the entertainment industry. And with us here to provide that commentary is Parrot Analytics Senior Strategy Analyst, Julia Alexander. Hello, Julia. And Morning, hey Brews, <laughs> Morning Brews entertainment host and creator, Brandon Katz. Hey. How you doing, guys? Uh, if you follow either of them on Twitter, you will know these two are prolific pop culture connoisseurs, so I highly recommend it. Um, and we're thrilled to have them give us the lowdown on the selection of finalists and trends that we're going to discuss today. Uh, I'm going to be present in the chat room, so if you have any questions, send them through there. We'll see if we can get to them in the end. If we can't, we will follow up with answers via email. And then uh, I will pop back up at the end of the convo with some questions that we pulled from the registrations. And of course, if you have other questions, we'll see if we can fit them in. And lastly, I wanted to give a special shout out to our Demand360 light users and enterprise partners. We're really thrilled to have you with us today. 
So uh, enough of me, I'm going to pass it off to Julia and Brandon. So take it away, guys. Absolutely. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, I think just to start it off, um, Brandon, why don't you introduce yourself a little so that everyone gathered here knows exactly who we are and, and what we do and what we talk about. Uh, makes a lot of sense. So I am the entertainment host and creator for Morning Brew. As many of you may know, Morning Brew is a daily email newsletter covering the kind of financial and business industry. They are expanding to cover the business of Hollywood, the business of entertainment. And I luckily get to be at the center of that expansion. Before that, for about four and a half years, I was the senior entertainment reporter at Observer.com, where I basically got paid to watch movies and TV shows and shout my opinions from the digital rooftop. So I am well versed in everything we're going to be talking about today. I'm thrilled to be joining the great team at Parrot Analytics. And Julia, we already basically DM and on Twitter about all things pop culture. Now we're just putting it in a slightly more professional setting. Yeah, we're now we're doing it on a Zoom, which is extremely exciting. Um, and just following up on that, and then we'll dive right into it. I'm Julia Alexander, as Rebecca said. I am our senior strategy um, analyst here. Before that, much like Brandon, I was a reporter in the, for about uh, 10 years at different outlets, um, including The Verge and Polygon and IGN. And I wrote about everything from windowing strategies and the streaming wars to just everything new happening in Star Wars or Disney, whatever it may be. Um, so with that said, let's dive right into it, looking at some of kind of the very uh, extremely exciting categories that we're going to cover, starting with, naturally, Squid Game and the Squid Game effect. Um, Brandon, do you think we can talk about entertainment in 2021 without... Uh, could you repeat that last bit, Julia? Yeah, do you think we could talk about entertainment in 2021 without talking about Squid Game? Uh, no, you know, it would be a kind of Herculean effort to try, but we're not that bold. You know, we're going to go with what is the biggest television sensation in 2021. And what I find so interesting about it is because in baseball, you know, there's the very simple strategy, hit the ball where the other team isn't. And I feel like here with Squid Game, Netflix's main advantage against its streaming competition is its unrivaled years-long investments in overseas content. And this feels like the exclamation point to that strategy. Absolutely. I always feel, I always think of Netflix as a, um, a portal of discovery. I think it is in its own ways, its own kind of centralized internet for so many people around the world, where everything that happens on Netflix to an extent, every cultural zeitgeist moment that they create can, is one of the few that can be experienced globally over streaming because they're in so many countries. And when I look at the, you know, the shows that we have up here with alongside the Squid Game effect, one of the shows in particular is Alice in Borderland. This was a Japanese series that came out a few months before Squid Game. But when Squid Game premiered, we saw using Parrot Analytics data that actually, because there was such strong affinity, meaning people who were watching Squid Game were seemingly also interested in Alice in Borderland, that show skyrocketed in demand. And I think that speaks to not only the Squid Game effect, although it naturally does, but also the power that Netflix has a, as a power stone, as a powerhouse to not only bring new series into the into cultural forefront and make a new, uh, someone's new favorite show, but do it three, four, five times over. Yeah, you know what? I am actually going to take partial credit for Alice in Borderlands uh, success post Squid Game because all of my friends, everyone in my network was like, hey, what should I watch now that I uh, finished Squid Game? And I said, Alice in Borderland. I said, Kingdom, which is another South Korean show. Uh, a lot of great things. So I, I must have recommended that to 50 people. So Netflix, you can send your check via mail. You know, I I'll wait on it. No worries. But I think you bring up a great point in that you know, the rising tide lifts all boats and Squid Game got people to go outside of their comfort zone and finally, you know, break down the wall of subtitles. And they realize, oh my God, non-American content is amazing. It is this huge, huge untapped well of potential and talent and quality. And we are becoming more open as a TV viewing public to things that don't originate in our country. And like you said, we're seeing huge demand uh, shifts for content that is somewhat related or at least, you know, non-English titles. And I love that Squid Game is able to knock down those doors for audiences because we need it. And because, listen, there, there's only so many TV shows about or movies about, a, you know, a, a, a handsome actor named Chris that you can follow. We need to change things up every now and then. 
And just from a business perspective, another uh, show, series on this page is Hometown Cha Cha Cha, which made but ended for 13 weeks on Netflix's top 10. As people might remember, Netflix has started releasing a global kind of weekly 10 hours, a top 10 for hours consumed for TV shows in English and non-English as well as films. And Hometown Cha 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 has 285 million hours consumed over 13 weeks. This is a South Korean series that became a massive broadcast hit in South Korea and then was distributed uh, by Netflix and has seen extreme demand in Indonesia and in parts of South America and parts of, of Europe. And so what that says again is that Netflix is creating this portal of discoverability, but it's not just Netflix. Although they are the ones definitely investing most heavily, I would argue, in South Korea from what we consider a more, you know, Americanized or, or Westernized um, company, we're gonna see it with Warner Media, we're gonna see it with Viacom, we're gonna see it with Disney and all the other players. So thinking about all this revolutionary content, I wanna jump into our the, the first, this next slide, which is, the, this is the most in-demand revolutionary series of 2021. These are the finalists. Um, so we have on page, Mayor of Easttown, Midnight Mass, Only Murders in the Building, Squid Game of Course, and The Nevers. Brandon, just wondering, looking at this screen, what pops out to you about what we're looking at here? I think each series, like you said, revolutionary series of 2021, and each to me, there is maybe a defining moment, a defining uh, uh, episode that I think elevates them to not just also rands of this endless deluge of content that us consumers must uh, sift through, but true peak TV successes. And so I can, you know, spit, spit, spit out a specific memory connected to each show, just seeing these on the screen. And I think users connect with those moments that cut through the clutter, clutter that become hashtag worthy OMG moments on Twitter. One of the things that I really love about the collection we have here is that not only are they revolutionary in terms of creating a type of story that we may have never seen before, and I think of Squid Game or Midnight Mass in particular, I'm a big, big fan of Midnight Mass, it's probably one of my top five shows of 2021, but when we look at something like Mayor of Easttown or The Nevers, these are revolutionary in part because they managed to do something within a genre, within a subgenre that is so different from what we've seen before. And I'm gonna throw out a title and I'm asking everyone to stick with me, but it reminds me a lot of what we saw back, you know, with Twilight or other movies where you have something within a genre that could be vampire with horror. And they managed to find something that connects with a, a whole new audience and creates a cultural zeitgeist, whether it's weekly or whether you're binging it over the course of a weekend. So I look at Mary of Easttown, I think, all right, gritty cop drama starring Kate Winslet. Um, and that's, the, the the gritty cop drama has been done before, but there's something about this series that just felt so unique and so passionate and so enthralling that it felt revolutionary, despite crime and detective series arguably being the cornerstone of television for the last 50, 60 years. Um, but I love that we can look around and everything, like you said, Brandon, there's the memory for myself as well tied with every single one of these shows. Do you have a personal favorite? Oof, I mean, I, I really liked a lot of these, but I think I got to go with Mayor of Easttown and Only Murders in the Building and then probably Squid Game. I think each of them brought something unique to the table. Like you said, not so much, you know, changing the way we approach television, but do so, doing something unique and attention worthy within an established and familiar genre, you know? So I think Mayor of Easttown, when spoiler alert for anyone who has not seen it, it's already several months old, so I hope you have but Detective Zabel's death, you know, other than the inciting crime, this is the first and most tangible moment of fallout from the actual story. And what's worse, it's largely Mayor's doing. So thematically, it's this huge pivot point for the series that I think redefines everything we watched before that moment and helps you go back onto Twitter or go back to the think pieces that come out in the week and build the conversation to a crescendo that some of these binge releases don't always reach. Absolutely. And I think it's beautiful that it's an HBO series and I'm reading um, Tinderbox, which is a thousand page oral history of HBO and I highly <laughs> recommend, but it reminds me of when they wanted to do Oz and they said, they said, we're going to kill off, you know, main character in the first episode and that you couldn't do that on TV. And of course, the executives at HBO said, but we're not TV, we're HBO. And I think that is what HBO has continuously done so well for decades. And I'm sure we'll continue to do for so many more decades. Um, you know, I think, well, also when we think about revolutionary, these are the most, these are our finalists, but shows like Dickinson, which are this, which I, I'm a big fan of shows like, um, 
Hellbound, which is another South Korean series that just dethroned um, Squid Game as it debuted on Netflix. All these new shows are coming out at a time when it feels like we are so dominated by heavy IP and heavy franchise. And it's nice to have a refreshing weekly or a refreshing binge that you can come to and have new characters and new worlds to explore that don't just feel like, well, I know this world and I love this world, but I want something new. Yeah, and, and I'm so curious now that you bring that up because looking at these five great series right here, I'm struck by how uh, variety, how much variety it has, how eclectic it is. I mean, like you said, Mayor of Easttown is a gritty cop drama. Midnight Mass is a horror series. Only Murders in the Building is this very self-aware comedy. Squid Game, this high concept drama. And The Nevers is a pure genre sci-fi play. So are audiences becoming more sophisticated and well-rounded in their tastes? Or are we just getting better quality within genres that maybe didn't always pop in the past? Perfect question. And that leads right into our next thing, which is uh, maybe the opposite of uh, revolutionary, but revolutionary in its own way, I would argue, which is that Marvel continues to Marvel. And this leads right into our uh, next topic. But I will say, Brandon and I know this, this phrase very well. Marvel continues to Marvel has become uh, an ongoing industry kind of joke, but in the best way about Marvel and the box office and Marvel on streaming, which is that it, the demand for these series and the demand for those films is just unparalleled. And we can see that when we look at our most in-demand superhero series of 2021, where we have The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Loki and WandaVision, all of which premiered within the first half of 2021, and then The Flash and Supergirl. Um, Brandon, what do you think? I'm struck immediately by the realization that all five of these belong to two separate shared cinematic universes. So obviously we have the MCU, which we're, we're going to talk about it more in a second. And then we have the Arrowverse for DC, which encompasses, you know, The Flash, Supergirl, Arrow, Legends of Tomorrow. And it really goes to show you how important the multiverse and the kind of shared interconnected web of storytelling has become not only for superhero material, but it's now metastasized to other franchises. We got The Fast and Furious with multiple small screen animated spinoffs and a spinoff with uh, The Rock and Jason Statham. We've got other franchises following suit such as Star Wars. So this has, this is a snapshot of modern franchise building across different platforms. I also appreciate that when we look at the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Loki and WandaVision, it has this beautiful element of when I, for example, when I look at a TV show and I think what would work as a spinoff or what would work as a to take the words from Dan Harmon, you know, kind of six seasons in a movie, how would you do that? The Win Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Loki, and WandaVision has this element of, if you consider the MCU as one long season of 24 episodes, <laughs> and it's building up to what this is, the MCU has found its spinoff. The MCU has found its right. secondary and third characters that they can go, people really like you, and we think there's an original story that we can tell here. And I, I'm struck by WandaVision because I, I know Brandon will remember this. WandaVision was originally supposed to be the third show that came out for Marvel, but because of the pandemic and because of reshoots and because of everything going on, they ended up making it the first series premiering on January 15th, 2021. And WandaVision, I think is by far probably my favorite of all five up there. And what it did in, in the way that it subverted superhero and the way that it took those characters and made them somehow even more perfect and stronger. Um, when I think of what the MCU has continued to do in terms of revolutionizing content, they have revolutionized the idea of what works on television and what works in film. Brandon, do you think we're gonna get to a point, I know this question comes up a lot, that will hit Marvel fatigue, or do you think that they're gonna do pretty okay for a minute? Listen, I think to answer that, we can actually look at WandaVision. Internally at Marvel, there's a reason why WandaVision was supposed to be the third series. And that is because they are so committed early on to that sitcom bit, uh, depicting different sitcom tropes and styles throughout the decades that they knew this is weird in a good way. This is uh, an abnormal approach to a television show that not everyone might get into right at first. And yet because of the pandemic, it had to go first. They said, okay, we're going to do the best we can. And it blew up. I mean, people who were never Marvel fans were interested in WandaVision. And I think it goes to show you that not even Kevin Feige and his legion of analysts and experts always know how the audience is going to respond. So we have been bemoaning superhero franchises for years and talking about Marvel fatigue for years. And yet 
they still keep winning. And now they've moved from the big screen winning onto the small screen. So I don't necessarily think Marvel's going to hit a wall unless the quality drops off. And we've seen even their most mediocre efforts are still pretty darn good. So while maybe a resetting of expectations is in order after the Infinity Saga, because not every film or TV show can be, you know, a billion dollar Oscar winner or whatever. Uh, I do think they are still going strong with a ton of exciting new characters and new stories on the horizon. So I don't think fatigue set in anytime soon. I agree. And I also, the what I love about this slide in particular is when I look up at it, I see Supergirl and the Flash. And those were a universe, I mean, that's the Greg Berlanti universe, the Arrowverse, as you said earlier, that was built from the TV ground up. And it is a TV universe. It is an inherently CW TV universe that works extremely well. That has one of the most loyal fan bases that is increasingly always in demand. Um, but what Flash has managed to do is also cross over with the film side where you, where you bring in Ezra Miller who will play, or who has played Barry Allen in Justice League and will play Barry Allen in Fla uh, Flashpoint coming out, I believe late next year. Um, and you have these two flashes interact with each other. And I think there's, you know, from a business perspective, there is this thing happening where Warner Media has Warner Brothers and they have HBO Max and they're going, how can we combine these worlds together? And that leads to Flash and Flashpoint. We have two Flashes hanging out together, which is what, as a big, big comic book reader, it's what every superhero fan wants. But you also have Peacemaker, the new John Cena show coming out of Suicide Squad, which was released this year, James Gunn directed. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that happen in Disney and Marvel Studios actually almost made this feel so revolutionized. But I think we also have to credit Jeff Loeb and what his team did with um, the Netflix Marvel Universe and also Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Agent Carter and how they kind of played into that when they didn't even know if the MCU was going to be as big as it became. Um, and now under Kevin Feige and with Disney Plus, it's much more structured. But I do think in terms of uh, with the theme of revolutionizing television, Marvel has revolutionized so much of entertainment. It, it almost just feels right that their next move is to revolutionize the small screen as well. Absolutely. And let's credit the comic book writers who initially came up with this idea of the multiverse, the crossover, the superhero team up, team up the blockbuster gathering, because now Marvel's really taken that paradigm and just applied it to live action and now animation as well. And we, like you said, we've seen the Arrowverse do it. We, we've seen other franchises do it. So it, it's so funny to see what started in the 1950s and 60s on the page now be the at the forefront of on-screen entertainment strategy. And in terms of revolutionary, I mean, listen, Star Wars is doing it. Everyone is doing it. So we are clearly in the midst of a new paradigm of going about building out your series and say, how do we squeeze out as much longevity as humanly possible from this particular IP? And it's it's very impressive. Now, if you're not a genre fan, you're not a huge superhero fan, maybe you're already at the fatigue point. But for hardcore devotees such as ourselves, I feel like we're just getting started. Is the next step from multiverse to have the multiverse in the metaverse? I think that's I think that's how it works. It's just all the verses at some point. Yep stacked on top of each other, you know, we're all just hanging out in the metaverse, multiverse, verse to the second power. It's gonna be fun. <laughs> With that said, let's continue talking a little about superheroes because we really can't, can't express enough just how revolutionary superhero culture has been in the last 20 years, the last decade, and especially this last year. But we also wanna talk about the talent that made these superheroes on screen, big and small, as beloved as they are. And so when we look at our finalists for most in demand superhero talent 2021, and this was pulled using data from uh, our talent demand tool, which is uh, very, very cool. We have Chris Evans, who played Captain America, John Cena, who played Peacemaker, Sebastian Stan, who's Winter Soldier, Tom Hiddleston, Loki, and Tom Holland, Spider-Man. So there's a lot of Toms happening and usually in, in superhero <laughs> stuff, a lot of Chris's and a lot of Toms. I gotta ask Brandon, do you have a personal favorite out of these five? Or do you have a personal favorite who's not listed here? Oof, that is a tough question. I, I think Tom Hiddleston is an incredible performer who does a, a lot of great things. I think, you know, Chris Evans has the star power. Uh, there's definitely a lot of names that aren't here that, that probably should be represented. I mean, I know Will Smith has only done Deadshot in the DCEU and only Hancock as an original superhero, but, you know, I, I don't know how he's not on this list. Uh, I just do find it funny in general, though, that 
we've moved into this era where the name above the marquee is much less important now than the name of the brand of the franchise because it used to be that audiences would buy ticket because Tom Cruise, Julia Roberts, Will Smith, they were starring in a movie. Now audiences are buying a ticket because it's another movie featuring Iron Man or Dominic Toretto or Luke Skywalker. And that transition has kind of reworked the entire economics of Hollywood to a degree. This is the chicken or egg question, right? It is, it is, you know, would the MC work without Robert Downey Jr. cast in Iron Man in 2008? No, I would argue no. But would the MCU continue with any actor you throw into a major role now because the MCU, yes. And I mean, we saw this debate to your point with the industry. We saw this with Scarlett Johansson over the summer and it's something that we will continue seeing. Um, and it's something that the Star Wars, uh, um, and it's that the industry has seen with Star Wars as well and has seen with um, Star Trek if they do new movies. And anything where the IP is just so massive that the turnout is going to be there no matter what. But I think also like when we think about talent, which is, you know, we are a creative industry. This is talent is still at the forefront of it. I think a lot about The Witcher and I have been thinking about The Witcher because the season two is coming out very soon. Uh, and I was thinking about how Henry Cavill who played Superman is probably one of my favorites that's not listed up here. Um, was perfect in that role. How he brought Gerald of Rivia to life in that role and how he was such a good Superman in Man of Steel and Batman beat Superman in Justice League and how I couldn't imagine anyone else in that role, you know, same with Christopher Reeve back in the day and just so many others. And so with superheroes, I feel like the people who play those roles, who bring them to life, it makes you feel like I can't picture anyone else doing it. And I think Tom Hiddleston and Chris Evans are perfect examples of that, where poor Tom Holland has a few other Spider-Men that are also very beloved, although he's a great Peter Parker. But, you know, I genuinely can't think of another Captain America who could do it as well as Chris Evans has. And I can't think of another um, Tony Stark who could, or Iron Man who could do it as well as Robert Downey Jr. has. And so I think when we look at the superhero, you're a hundred percent right. And I agree with you. And I know the industry definitely does where the IP is the selling point, but these faces and these actors who encompass these characters who bring these 2D characters to 4D life in so many ways, um, I think it's a really spectacular thing that we can look at them and has to have a strong visceral reaction to seeing Chris Evans in that suit. I'm wondering if it's a double-edged sword these days, because I agree, you know, you have to nail casting or people aren't going to want to go on a journey with your character. And yet everyone you have up here, a great collection of really talented performers, no offense to them, their movies have struggled financially outside of the safety net of the MCU or whichever franchise they belong to. And we have to wonder, you know, are, are IP driven films and familiar brands the only thing we can get away with these days from a monetary standpoint? You know, do, does a talented roster of stars still drive profits? It's such an interesting conversation and such a, a tipping point for Hollywood as they try to build profitable movies, which is becoming more and more difficult, unfortunately. Yeah, and I think, you know, kind of last point, but I, I, I look at Sebastian Stan in particular, and I think he's extremely interesting, along with his co-star, Anthony Mackie, who plays Falcon to his Winter Soldier, of course, because um, they their show came from their chemistry, seen on set interviews and seen on press interviews, and then the fandom just loving Bucky Barnes and being like, they love Sebastian Stan as Bucky Barnes. You cannot open TikTok if you're on Marvel TikTok without seeing <laughs> Sebastian Stan um, or many other websites, YouTube and, and Tumblr. And I think that speaks to how he really brought that character into light. But, you know, I look at this, this roster of people and I just think, what a great time to be a, a fan of, of superhero movies. Um, but thinking of, of talent and, what, and, and how this leads into our culture... We're going to talk a little bit about reality TV. Are you a reality TV fan, Brandon? Or are you more scripted? You stick to your scripted I, series. I'm definitely more of a scripted person. I'm getting a little bit more into the reality and the unscripted realm. And I'm recognizing the value that it can bring to the table, particularly if we're talking about, you know, a studio trying to compete in the streaming wars or something like that. So uh, I'm becoming a better student of this world. I love that. Well, I look at this screen. I'm a huge Keeping Up with the Kardashians fan, um, and let's look into it. So our most in-demand reality series of 2021, we have Impractical Jokers, Keeping Up with the Kardashians, MasterChef Australia, Shark Tank, and The Voice. What really surprises me about some of these ones up here, and I, I guess it shouldn't surprise me, but it still does, is how well competitive series still do in a streaming-focused world. Because it can almost feel like competitive series are harder 
to transition from a typical broadcast linear schedule into a very on-demand, very no appointment kind of TV necessary um, consumer base. But I look at this and I think, look, there, the three at 60% of them are, are, uh, are competitive shows. Yeah, I would have not thought that if you had asked me beforehand, but I guess people have this innate addiction, which I completely understand and I share, to these competitive series to see winners and losers. And I'm wondering if uh, bingeability plays a factor and they can kind of skip right to the end in certain instances, or what is the driving motivating factor for these types of shows and the success they've seen on streaming? Because it really is surprising and impressive. I totally agree. And, you know, I also look at keeping up with the Kardashians and thinking of our theme of revolutionary, you know, when the when keeping up came along, it was not the first to do what it had. I mean, the Lord's This American Life had premiered 40 years ago. It was very different, of course. Um, but there was Laguna Beach and there was um, uh, the, um, the, the Hills and there was The Simple Life. And there was all these other shows where you had this kind of influencers, early age influencers in front of a camera doing reality TV and, and finding an audience. But Keeping Up With The Kardashians felt like this, this intimate moment with a, a typical, which sounds funny to say now, but a typical American family where siblings were fighting and they were, they're going, they have their dating lives and they're fighting with their parents and things are going on and they're all just trying to figure out how to make it. Uh, in America, albeit with uh, quite a bit more privilege than, than most other uh, Americans. Um, but this family really drew you in and, and they became part of your life. And I remember, you know, I've laughed and cried with many of the moments that the Kardashians have shared. And it's funny to think of how they revolutionized television, where when they premiered, you watched that show every single week to see what was going on with Kim and Chloe and Courtney and Kylie and Kendall and whomever. And now towards the end of that, the end of their, of their series, at the end of their series, not only have they revolutionized the concept of social media, where they dominate it, where they have used social media as a tool to get people to watch their show, but you can see the evolution of our current internet age, of our current social age through their influence on their television show. It was documented, almost like a, a documentary. And Brenda, I wonder if you have thought about the kind of the Kardashian impact in general, just on our culture and on television. I think of, um, of the uh, Car Charlie D'Amelio show on Hulu, which has very strong keeping up with the Kardashian vibes and that follows this TikTok star's family as they try to make it in Los Angeles. I think they kind of epitomize the revolutionary strategy that is unscripted television. And I may not be a fan of the, you know, the real housewives, but that kind of wine throwing expletive laden reality television or unscripted content in general, it's very inexpensive to make. It's highly bingeable. It's great for both background noise while you're folding your laundry or really engaged viewing. And I think there's a reason every single major streaming service has some sort of foothold in the unscripted realm. It's low cost, high reward, bang for your buck propositions, and they help reduce churn. They're not necessarily central attractions in their own right, but they're huge engagement factors. And I think you know, if we're looking ahead too, that's why the combination of Warner Media and Discovery can potentially be so fruitful because it's a lot of kind of complementary content. And it's a reason why so many of these studios and streamers are making such a push in this exact realm. I think keeping up with the Kardashians, that is the modern contemporary uh, model that every other competitor is trying to reverse engineer today. And it's so interesting to see that shadow that they've cast on the industry. Because, you know, you want to talk about revolutionary, this is the exclamation point for contemporary reality. Andy Cohen could not have said it better himself. Um, this, I'm so excited to talk about this category, which I've lovingly referred to as old doesn't mean out of style. And this is looking at our most in-demand legacy series of 2021. And so we have Band of Brothers, Dragon Ball Z, Mr. Bean, Neon Genesis, Evangelion, and Seinfeld. And the thing that strikes me the most immediately is not only how relevant these shows are in 2021, even though they premiered 20 years ago, it is how integral they are to the future of many franchise development and many uh, um, series orders at various network studios and streaming services around the world. Brandon, what are your thoughts? I think this is the most eclectic group of shows that we have gathered here today, because if you had asked me what these things have in common, these shows, I, I wouldn't have been able to give you an answer, but I, I will say, I wanna ask you a question, Julia. 
When you go to your favorite restaurant, how often do you get the same exact order? Unfortunately, very often. <laughs> I, that's <laughs> right, who but, I am as a person. But that makes sense because that familiarity and that high floor of quality expectations, it's hard to beat. And I look at these shows and I see it, I see it's the same thing in entertainment, you know, something new and never before seen. It's very hard to market and it must actively convince viewers to tune in. Something familiar like these five shows that are very popular and well-known over the last two plus decades or something connected to a well-known brand, it helps ameliorate both of those obstacles immediately. And I do find it ironic that the sitcoms, you know, that have been selling for half a billion dollars on streaming like Seinfeld, they don't have much franchise potential. You know, they're great for endless rewatches in an industry otherwise defined by finite offerings, but there's not much additional value that can be squeezed out of The Office or Friends and Seinfeld. Whereas, you know, some anything built out from Marvel or DC or Star Wars, or like you said, you know, Dragon Ball Z and Neon Genesis, which are still going in different permutations, that can keep adding new characters, new stories, ad nauseum. So I, I'm so intrigued by the fact that these are familiar series and that's the through line. And yet each of them has such a different permutation moving forward than the next one. Yeah, I think of these shows a lot as a, as a term I coined a few years ago called snackable TV, which is the biggest retention driver you can have in the industry, which is something that you throw on before you go to bed. It's something you put on when you're cooking. It's something that your kids watch. It's something that is just constantly in your home. It is snackable. It is the popcorn of television um, or, the, or the cookies of, of television. Um, and sitcoms are perfect for that because sitcoms, you just throw in procedurals. You throw them on, you know what's going to happen or you know what the joke is, and you can rewatch it over and over and over again. That's why Friends and Seinfeld and 30 Rock or procedurals like Law and Order are just so beloved for so many generations. But when we look at something like Neon Genesis Evangelion, Band of Brothers, um, what we see, and even uh, I'm going to say The Sopranos, what we see is the potential for them to do more, where you have Warner Media say, we have this beloved IP. What if we do a prequel movie looking at to a young Tony? What if we do a new Band of Brothers um, universe movie, or series, I, I should say, over at Apple TV? Neon Genesis Evangelion has an ongoing kind of thing that they're looking into with the uh, abundance of new fans that have come in when it arrived on Netflix. And so new, like old is never out of style because people will one, find a way to watch it, even if it's just snacking on it, if it's something to put on before bed. But two, there's always room to do more if you know what you're doing and how to create a new series or a new film. And I think that's the beauty of it. Like everything is cyclical in so many ways. Um, I'm just going to get through this because we are, we're, Henry, we're getting close to the end, but I want to make sure we talk about our most in-demand TV series of 2021. Attack on Titan, La Casa de Papel or Money Heist, Rick and Morty, The Walking Dead, WandaVision. Brandon, I'm looking at this and two things strike me. One, I love that we have Attack on Titan because I'm a big anime fan and this just goes to show how in-demand and how global anime has been for the last 20, 15, 10 years, but especially the last half decade. Um, and also, I love that The Walking Dead is still as in demand as it is, because I'm not going to lie, I fell off uh, towards season seven, eight, but it is just absolutely massive still. I also fell off around uh, season seven, so please, you know, don't, don't put us in TV jail. But I think this lineup of shows speaks to the power of genre, because if you saw in the pa pandemic, particularly from Parrot Analytics, great data, the most watched shows were all a genre bent, you know, sci-fi, fantasy, you know, horror, something that wasn't a, a straightforward drama, or straightforward comedy. And I really think that what was once on the periphery of the mainstream, this nerdy type of Star Wars, Marvel, this geeky culture is now the bedrock of mainstream cool. And I think it's so amazing how we've come full circle in that regard and how, again, what was once considered niche is now gen generally the foundation of our everyday entertainment. And it goes to show you why every single streaming service is looking for their own Game of Thrones, Stranger Things, or Mandalorian. I think it also, the anime and the animation stuff, especially, I think when I look at the kind of breakdown of, of generational affinity over the last 40, 50 years, you know, children of the 70s and 80s were the first to not give up um, their collector's toys, right? This is something that you've heard directors say where they were, have very visceral memories of buying a Star Wars action figure and, and keeping it. Children of the 90s and early 2000s grew up with this idea of, 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 of comics and, and really, uh, not just comics, but like extremely good adaptations and cartoons that were happening early morning Saturdays and 
on the big screen. You had X Men, the animated series. You also had Spider Man in 2002 hitting the big screen, becoming absolutely massive, and Batman in 1999. You have all these things happening. And then as you get into the later ages, we see that animation not only doesn't go away, it becomes more in demand and becomes more adult. And I think that speaks to there's an audience of consumers, an audience of viewers who grew up with cartoons and anime and never wanted to get, never wanted to stop. They just found things that spoke to them. And so you got this huge demand for Death Note and, and this demand for Naruto and Rick and Morty, where Rick and Morty is this incredibly funny and um, sad and wildly absurd cartoon on an adult swim, which, you know, pioneered it. Um, the pioneer's idea and, and that audience was that was with them from 2000 right into where they are now and um i think it's really i think we look at this and it's just incredible that we have some animations and anime a spanish series a superhero series a zombie series i think that speaks to your, what you're saying genre is in and um i, I, I we, we have this this way we're gonna get through pretty quickly because i know we have questions but the most exceptional streaming platform of 2021 we have prime video Apple TV Plus, Disney Plus, HBO Max, Paramount Plus, many of which, or I should say uh, a couple of which launched very recently. And so Brandon, with this in mind, what is kind of one takeaway that you would have when what's next for the streaming wars? Let's say 12 months, 18 months, five years from now. I think consumers, audiences need to recognize and appreciate that we will never have it as good as we do now. We will never have this much content, this much quality, this much production value as we do right now. Because as we look ahead, basic economics dictate that not every single premium SVOD service of the eight or nine that are out there is going to succeed, whether it's through voluntary opt-out, forced opt-out, consolidation, the number of major players is going to decrease in the future. And when that happens, it means production is going to go down, our options are going to go down, the, the number of shows and movies we have available to us are going to go down. So let us just take a moment and revel in the most competitive moment in SVOD history right now. Let us enjoy that we Never ever say that there's nothing on TV to watch because we have so many options at our fingertips. And I'm so excited because I'm such a passionate, proud couch potato that we can just sit here and scroll through endless options. So in the next couple of years, you're going to see a, a winnowing of major players. And that's unfortunately going to impact how much and, and what kinds of shows and movies we have available to us here on our couches. Yeah, I think if I have to make one prediction, it, it's kind of in line with yours um, and keeping with the colloquial, uh, colloquial streaming wars terminology, I think we will see a lot more companies become content arms dealers. I think it is increase a lot of these networks and studios enter the streaming wars as content suppliers and as creatives and are now in charge of distribution and technical aspects, which were handled by the carriers, the telco carriers. Uh, and the cable side uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And that's a hard transition to make. There are issues that come with that. It's why Disney bought Bamtech. It's why Netflix spends so much of their earnings talking about A-B testing 400, 500 times throughout the year. It is a core aspect to their businesses. And I think not every company needs to be good at the technical side. You can be extremely good at the creative side and look at Sony and say, our content is worth so much. We want to license it out. And I think that's going to be overall better for consumers. I think instead of spending $90 on a fragmented space of 10 streaming services, if consumers can spend $50 on four streaming services that then have some of the best content licensed to them by some of the best players in the game, that's really where we want to be. Otherwise, if we're all going to just have different little channels, because streaming services are bundles made up of little channels known as titles, they're made up of TV shows and movies. If we're just going to have 30, 40 of those, cable starts to look really great again, it, it, plus sports. Um, but I, you know, I, I know that we're running out of time, so I want to give it back to Rebecca uh, and take any po uh, possible questions we might have if we have the time for it. Yeah, awesome. Thank you both so much. That was incredible. I was laughing to myself here <laughs> during the conversation. You guys provided a lot of very colorful commentary on uh, the finalists for the Global TV Demand Award. So I appreciate that. Um, we are at time. So I do want to respect everyone's time. If you have to drop off, that's no problem. I would say, Julia, you know, we had a few questions that came in from the registrations and we pulled those. Why don't you select one question that you've thought about and we can end with your thoughts on that final question. You pick. 
Yes, uh, I don't have it in front of me, but I do oh. have, speaking of technical issues uh, when it comes to um, distribution, there was a great one about um, adult uh, animation that I thought was phenomenal. Um, and so I think Brandon and I can definitely talk about that a little, Rebecca, if you have it in front of you by chance, you could read it. Um, I otherwise do. I can try to find it. Thanks. Yeah, let me pull it up. So the question was, what's the successful future of adult animation look like? Example, is it more like Love, Death, and Robots as part of the post-pandemic animation boom? So I um, consider myself a student of Mike Lazo. I grew up very much on Adult Swim. It is my, 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 my bread and butter. Um, but I think the answer to this actually lies in a show called Bojack Horseman, which did uh, this, it was a beautiful, poignant series, and I think what adult animation can do, it teams with the right creative, is just explore a more visceral humanity than actors potentially can, just because of the what cartoons and what uh, animation allows people to do. I think there is a niche that is not being served, and that's horror animation. I think well done horror animation, a la the style of Jason Bloom and Bloomhouse could do extremely well for a streaming service because we see that demand for horror is consistently seeing, especially dystopian thriller, dystopian horror. But I think where we're really gonna see go with adult animation, again, looking back to what I was saying about how consumers who are now in their 20s, 30s, um, are, grew up with animation and don't wanna get rid of it. And people who are 10, 11, 12 are gonna be in the exact same boat because they have a wealth of animated series just being thrown at them uh, and they can consume. I think where we go is seeing a lot more investment in this, a lot more investment in our, shows like Arcane, shows like BoJack, shows like Love, Death, and Robots, and be, them giving the, giving the freedom to just try and experiment with the art style and storytelling that they can't do with humans because there's just limit, there's limitations on uh, real lives. Uh, but Brandon, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, to bounce off what you were saying, as much as I enjoy Love, Death, and Robots or a Star Wars Visions, I think the future is still more serialized adult animation. I think there's a reason why BoJack, an unbelievable show you just mentioned, is one of the few Netflix originals ever to reach six plus seasons. And that is because I think there's somewhat of a ceiling on the anthology format, at least domestically here in the US. And I think one way to circumnavigate that is to create these highly engrossing, highly well-built new universes like an arcane that immediately strike a chord with people and carry over episode to episode, season to season, and can grow a fan base over time rather than, oh, I can pop in on any single episode, you know, enjoy it, get it, and then get out. It's not much as a, a, of a audience connection, I think, even though they're high quality uh, art and entertainment. So I think the future is definitely more serialized, long form to st storytelling in that realm. Like you said, like a BoJack, which, you know what, I, I think your impassioned defense of the show, I got to go rewatch it because it's just that good. <laughs> You've inspired me. Thank you for making my weekend plans for me. Yeah, I'll take a check, Reed Hastings. <laughs> I'll just take a check in the mail. <laughs> Everyone's getting paid today. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you both so much. That is time. Thank you to everybody who attended and shared your comments and questions in the chat. Uh, again, you can see the finalists and all of the 20 categories for the awards at www.globaltvdemandawards.com. We will be announcing the winners for each of those finalists. I'm sorry, each of the categories in January 2022. 2022. Woo. Um, so we, once we have the full year of data, we will be able to say which are the top TV shows in the world, uh, of, of this past year. So again, thank you very much, Brandon. Thank you, Julia. Hope everybody has a wonderful day and we will see you back here for the next Parrot Analytics Live. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks guys.